Hello, welcome to the University of Brighton podcast. I'm Richard Newman. Well, here we are again in another national lockdown in England. If you're a staff or student, you'll have received emails about what we're doing to keep the university open and keep you safe during this period. Please keep an eye on social media and our website, brighton.ac.uk forward slash coronavirus as well. But it's good timing to catch up with our principal lecturer, virologist, Dr. Sarah Pitt, also a fellow of the Institute of Biomedical Science, to do another Q&A about all things COVID. You may have seen or heard Sarah a lot on the BBC News Channel, Five Live, local radio, Bloomberg, LBC Radio, you name it. Sarah's probably been on it, uh, giving her expert opinion over the last few months. So we're very lucky to have her. Um, so thanks for coming on, Sarah. I'm gonna, it's great to have you back on. I think it's the third time you've been on the podcast, hasn't it? Thank you. Yes, I think it is. Yes, I'm... Yeah, regular guest. Um, you might as well be our <laughs> co-presenter. Uh, so let, let, let's, uh, let's fire away with some questions from students and staff that we've had come in through social media. Um, a lot of people want to remain anonymous, so we'll keep them all anonymous. Um, so we might flip around from one thing to another throughout this podcast, but lots here for you to answer. So let's get stuck into it. So the first question, for those people who have had COVID, how long do you have antibodies? And does this mean you're immune for a short time? We don't know for sure how long the antibodies last but the evidence is showing that it's possibly only a matter of months maybe two or three months it's also worth bearing in mind that what we we do also know that not everybody even makes antibodies at all so the fact that you've had covid doesn't really tell you anything apart from the fact that you had covid and hopefully you've recovered from it but it doesn't mean to say you're not going to get it again and it doesn't matter doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be protected um, from getting it again you know in, in the next in the few months okay. in a few months time it's possible that you probably be safe for about a, m a month or so but I can't say, even say that for sure because we don't really know and then the point about it is it's a brand new virus mm. and it normally takes 10, 10 years or something to gather all the data about all the patients in order to collate all the information and make a make a real judgment on that so mm. um the answer is possibly a few months but i can't tell you for sure okay so with that in mind then um this links to another question we've had um which sort of links with it as well so antibodies but also different slight mutations of the virus different strains um oh. will this mean that new vaccines when they do come in will be required will that one with these vaccines that come in almost be a little bit redundant if the vaccine can continues to change the mutations that we've seen so far would haven't won't be affected by the vaccine so the vaccine would still work against the, the prevailing strains that are around at the moment. And what seems to have happened is that some, a particular mutation has taken off and been really strong. So there's one that spread around the whole of Europe in March, April time, and was found all over Europe. And then there's another one that was reported in the news about two or three weeks ago that they found that had arose in, in, a, um, in somewhere in Spain and then had been transmitted by people going on holiday to Spain that mm. then got transmitted all around Europe. And that one strain is now sort of prevailing in, in most parts of certainly Northern Europe. But um, that's, the vaccine would still work against those strains. So hopefully not, hopefully yeah. not. Okay, so a question for me then, I guess, from the, on the back of that one, is, is that one of the reasons potentially this strain that's sort of taken over the one that seems to originate in Spain, is that the reason why, or part of the reason why we've seen a, an increase in infection rates over these last few months? Is it, is it more infectious than the one we've been dealing with before? It does look as though that might be the case, yes. I mean, the, this, this particular strain is very infectious, and given that what we're seeing across the whole of Europe, the, the, the version of the virus that we're dealing with at the moment is very, very infectious, and it does look as though everyone going on all holidays mixing mixing or people up around the whole of Europe so it started off in Spain and then moved to all the other countries and then while everyone was going on holiday to France or Greece or whatever that mutant was out there in all in all the different countries and it's just spread itself very nicely so the fact that it's very infectious mm. um, is probably why it's happening but I have to stress the actual disease it's causing is no more or less 
um, were no worse mm. or no better than than it was in the previous version. It's not, it's it's more infectious, but it's not more dangerous. Okay. But having said that, it's still a dangerous virus. Sure. And I, I, so we have another question, which is asking for um, a bit of a recap, really, as to you know how this is being spread. But um, so sort of linking with that, then what makes it what makes that more infectious? Um, it seems as though once it gets inside you, it's more just more able to latch on to the cells inside your inside your lungs, and therefore, and then it, once it gets inside the cells, it can then um, grow and divide and produce a lot more virus. And then the more virus that you've got, the more that gets into your mouth and nose, then the more opportunities it is for it to be spread to, to other people. Okay. So it's kind of the biology of the virus that's making it more infectious in some way. Yeah, okay. Um, next question is the, the, the demographics of infection rate seem to have changed uh, at least over the last few months for there were older people to younger people. Uh, why is that? Um, it's, to, the, it's to do with the way the people are behaving. So the virus hasn't changed, but what we're doing has changed and if you remember over this um a lot of people probably had covid in march and april without necessarily knowing they had it because they they were either not very ill or you know didn't have symptom, strong symptoms or didn't have any symptoms at all certainly didn't get a test mm. maybe you might have felt a bit rubbish and went to bed for a day or two and then felt a bit rubbish for a bit longer but never actually got diagnosed with covid um, whereas the older people were getting and the people with underlying conditions were getting very seriously ill and ending up in hospital and therefore being tested and noted as a COVID case. Mm -hmm. um, so once we started testing more people, uh, a people were more aware of that they might what the symptoms were and that might be them. And then also we were able to test more people. We found it more in the younger age group, which isn't to say that it wasn't there before. And what you've noticed is that, yes, over the summer, it had um, moved, or, well, we were seeing fewer cases in the older people, probably because they were taking more care mm -hmm. to, to try and not get it. Um, but then once everybody started moving around um, after the lockdown came, came off, you know, over the summer, younger people were getting it. And then they have now spread it to their parents and their grandparents and, and the older people. So okay. I don't think that anything has particularly changed apart from we're just finding it more because we're looking for it more. Sure. Okay. Um, let's get on to herd immunity because you've been quite, you, you've been quite outspoken about this on the, on the, on BBC news as well. Um, but look, to, today we're recording this on on uh, on the Thursday, the first day of lockdown. Um, I've heard uh, one of the um, the rebelling uh, Tory MPs, uh, Hugh Merriman, on the radio this morning talking about how um, uh, he voted against lockdown and how we might just have to live with this virus and maybe we should just be doing that uh, until there's a vaccine. Um, the theory of herd immunity and the understanding of it anyway, why is that theory of just letting everyone just get on with it rubbish? Well, the theory of herd immunity is that once a certain percentage of the population are immune to a, an infectious disease, however that has come about, then it will start to die out. We have never actually eliminated a virus through just through natural infection. We've only ever managed it either to eliminate it altogether in the world like smallpox or reduce the reduce it to the fact that it's almost eliminated across the world um things like measles and polio through a, a coordinated global vaccination campaign mm. so herd immunity is not going to work through natural infection anyway and as we said earlier if you do develop uh, an immune response to this particular virus it only lasts maybe a couple of months in some people possibly in most people. Yep. We don't know for sure, but we do know that it doesn't last for very long in sufficient numbers of people that you will never get to the um, required num the required amount of people who are covered to be covered by natural immunity for a sufficient amount of time, which would be at least one or two years. Mm -hmm. And you've actually got to get 60% of the people. 
Yeah. The other problem is that where they've had a lot of COVID in the, in the spring, sorry, um, places like Spain and Sweden where they didn't, where they kind of did try and let the virus move around, and even in this country, and they've gone into sort of hotspot populations, towns where there was a lot of COVID, maybe healthcare workers who were very highly exposed to the COVID, found that they're finding an immune response in perhaps 10% of people usually less than that so even when we do let it go around and do whatever it wants to do and by the way that does mean people are going to die and I'm not sure that we really want to be doing that if we can help it um it, we're never going to get to the required amount which will be 60 70 percent anyway yeah. um my idea of living with the virus is getting it so that it's more or less under control and we have small outbreaks which I think we are still we are going to get probably for some time to come. Small local outbreaks, if the testing and tracing system is up and running, we can identify that small outbreak, jump on it like a ton of bricks, say, find out who needs to be self-isolating, make sure it's possible for them, they have the support and the, um, the care that they need to actually do self-isolating. So they quarantine themselves and their contacts so that it doesn't spread any further than that small outbreak. And that I think is what living the virus is going to look like right. rather than just letting it do its thing. Okay, so let's move on to this next question that is a little bit uh, linked to that then. Um, we, so I, I guess that kind of means that in theory, the regional lockdowns we had before the national lockdown was kind of the right idea, but maybe hmm. test and trace wasn't quite up to scratch. And we've yes. been taught, we've been told about how uh, this, uh, we will have this world beating system. Labour leader Sakia Starmer says this lockdown, this four week lockdown, if it is just four weeks, uh, needs to be used to fix NHS test and trace and make it completely suitable. Do you think it has been up to scratch so far? Um, and do you think that is the best way of using this new national lockdown? Yes, I think we really do need to have a pause on everything, try and stop um, the transmission of the virus at least a little bit. For the, for the time being and sort out the test and trace, absolutely. And what I do think is that all the people in the different bits of the system, so the people who are doing the collecting the swab samples, the people who are doing the laboratory testing and the people who are doing the contact tracing, all those individual, all those people in all those individual groups are working their socks off. It's just not properly coordinated. And what we know is that people, a really small percentage of people, I think it might be only 20% of people who are supposed to be self-isolating are not doing it. So what we really need to do, rather than doing more testing, we need to be going to the people who, talking to the people who are supposed to be isolating and try and understand why they're not doing it. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea of bringing the contact tracing back to the local public health teams. I think it's really, really important to do that. Your local public health teams know your area and potentially they can either knock on your door, obviously with social distancing, that could be a problem, but you could have a local phone call from somebody who, who can say to you, you're supposed to be self-isolating. What can we do to help you? How can we make that possible for you? We'll do your shopping. Don't worry about that. Um, oh yes, you're caring for your granny that lives up the road. We will look after your granny. She lives at number 25 Acacia Avenue. That's fine, I've told her GP. You don't need to worry about that. All you need to worry about is just staying home and staying indoors and staying well. Um, and that, that I think is probably more important, like the personal touch is, is more important. We've got very lost, I think, in the big data, 500,000 tests a day, 25,000 new cases. You know, we, we've seen all those big graphs and everything, but every single one of the data points on those graphs is a person. And the only way we can actually deal with the virus is dealing with the way human beings are reacting to the virus and the way humans interact with each other. And so actually, yes, you're right sorting out the test and trace is we have to spend that four weeks doing that yeah okay so um staying on testing then how much since we last talked have the sort of more rapid tests come on in terms of their accuracy we know about there's going to be a um well from today the day that this um, podcast is going out uh, a mass testing pilot is beginning in liverpool which should produce a result in around 15 minutes everyone in the city will have access to this and the hope from boris johnson is that this will be rolled out across towns and cities before christmas how accurate are these tests compared to the lab ones 
um, they're probably about 70, 80% accurate compared to the, to the main lab tests. Okay. And so what- Which what, is better, what, isn't it, than what we talked about before earlier yes. in the year? Yes, so they are a bit better, but they're still going to miss two or three in 10 COVID positive people. So what I think about the mass screening is it's worth a try, but I don't think it's going to be an easy way out of the, of the situation that we're in. And what does worry me slightly is that it, what people really need to understand is that if you have a test on a particular day in the laboratory, we normally would report that as virus not detected, which isn't the same as negative. So what that test says is that sample that you took and we put it in this test, according to that test, we didn't find any virus. That doesn't mean to say that you're negative and you can go around and, and hug all your friends and forget about social distancing. It means that you haven't got a really high amount of virus in your um, in your system because that would definitely be picked up even by these rapid tests so it's sort of proceed with caution and then obviously if you if you're picking up the positives those people can then be referred to the the test track and trace system and be taken out of of circulation and so people who don't have symptoms but get picked up on this uh, on the rapid test with mass testing will then go into the to the um the normal system which they would might not have applied for a test before because they yeah. didn't have the symptoms so we will pick up some people that way and it will be it will help but it's definitely not going to be the answer to everybody's prayers and the tests are very very expensive even though they're saying they're quite cheap they are each all tests are expensive um and there are going to be quite a lot of logistical issues i think i think it'd be interesting to see how it goes yeah um, because although the test itself takes 15 minutes, I don't think you'll be in and out of a testing centre with your result. I think it's going to probably take you possibly even an hour, certainly half an hour. You've got to have this queue up, have the swab taken, have the test done, then someone tells you your result. You mm -hmm. know, that's if they're doing a lot of testing, that's going to be, there's going to be quite a lot of queuing and waiting for your yeah. results at this point. So you might be half an hour or so. And whether you'd want to do that every fortnight, mm. it's a, it is a swab test. As far as I understand it, the one they're using at the moment in Liverpool, it's not a saliva test, it's a swab test, which means someone's got to come and stick a swab up your nose or, or, the, or a proper throat swab gets your gag reflex. It's quite uncomfortable. Mm. And so if you don't have symptoms and you don't think you've been in contact with anyone, you might not want to keep being tested because it's you know it's inconvenient for you so i think a little bit depends on how well it goes in the beginning if it's very smooth and people are happy with it then there might be a big take up from it but yeah. i think it remains to be seen <laughs> it'll be interesting to see and i'm sure there will be teething problems at the start whilst they uh, mm. iron out this is the whole point of a pilot yeah. um mm. this is a big question <laughs> it's a difficult one to answer um national lockdown it's supposed mm -hmm. to be four weeks mm -hmm. um is that likely do we think that there's a possibility that within four weeks we will go back to the tiered system um it's a difficult question to answer i know um i i guess from our point of view where we live at the moment the infection rates are still relatively low but they were increasing quickly so i guess from in the south of england potentially it's easier to make that decision isn't it but it really would it really will come down to how those big infection areas like uh manchester uh like greater manchester like liverpool like leicester um come down it's i'm hopeful that because the lockdown means that people are not going to be moving around as much as they were last week which means you're not individuals are not going to come in contact with as many people in your normal course of your day. So you're not going to be going into some shops, you're not going to go into uh, the gym and so on. You it would just, the fact that we're reducing the amount of people moving around, the number of people who are not in your household that you're coming into contact with is reducing. It should get the numbers down and it should happen quite, quite not quite rapidly, but should we should be able to mm. notice it. Um, one of the things which I was looking at in the graphs which were being presented by the chief medical officer and chief scientific officer in the presentation that the prime minister did where um, on the 31st of October where they called for the lockdown 
or they announced the lockdown, and was that the graphs from Wales, Scotland, and even in the Northwest, where they had done some, already done some form of a lockdown, the numbers hadn't gone down, but they hadn't, they weren't going up to the same rate. They'd sort of, they, they sort of plateaued, they sort of leveled off on their graphs. I was looking for that and I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. Nobody really, they didn't really pick that one up, I think, in the presentation. But the fact that some form of a lockdown does seem to have helped in other parts of the country could show that it will, um, at least stop the numbers going up, even if they haven't started to come down yet. Okay. So, of course, what we don't know, none of us know, is whether what the criteria for coming out really are. Mm -hmm. um, and so whether if the numbers have started, if the numbers of new cases has gone going down, will that be enough for us to say we'll come out of lockdown? But I think you're right. We will go into some kind of a tiered system rather than it won't be like it was in the summer where we came out of lockdown mm -hmm. and then everything was opened up again quickly we will do it and i'm hoping we will do it just slowly and gently this yeah. time yeah and, and i think you're uh, uh you're right about those other areas as well it's, it's uh, some of those areas have been in lockdown for mm. you know six seven eight more weeks than mm. that by the time that this this national lockdown comes to an end so it's not just the four-week lockdown for those worst affected areas is it i guess the hope is that if it's those that that curve has been flattened as we keep hearing hopefully mm. if that was the case last week we maybe start to see some, some infections going down. Um, a question from one staff member about um, schools specifically, because universities are able to, where possible, teach remotely. But what about schools? Um, how safe is it in terms of, are, they, are school children going to be spreading this virus? Yes, they are. We know they are. We've known that all along. But it's, it's a balance between the children's education and their mental well-being and their welfare against trying to control the virus. And we're at that stage at the moment where we're trying to balance um, all the different um, competing things of, of our lives with trying to bring the virus under control. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously we, what we really want to do is bring the virus under control and then all the rest of all the other rest of aspects of our lives will, will fall back into place. Mm -hmm. But the government did promise Back in back in the summer that they would keep schools open as long as they could as far as they could and that they would potentially close down other bits of the our lives um as a trade-off to keeping schools open and that's actually what they've done they've closed the pubs yep. so that we can keep the schools open and so schools are doing have done everything they possibly can to make the the environment as covid secure as they possibly can and it's probably what it's worth going with keeping the schools open for them for now and and hoping that the other measures will bring the with the will bring the thing um will bring the numbers yeah. down okay because there, there's um talking about the balance um recreational sport has been stopped for example and um there's been a bit of criticism about that from some high profile people so patrick valance has said that there's actually little evidence that children can spread the virus outside mm -hmm. so was that the wrong decision or is that the right thing to do as well yeah, it is because what happens is okay. So you, we're talking about maybe children's sports team. So you, the parents, take the small child to the sports centre or the the sports field if it's an outdoor sport. Mm -hmm. So some people will have driven. Not everybody. Some people will go on the bus. Um, and when you get there, you will be trying to social distance from all the other all the other people around but it won't be it is not going to be possible the children people are running around and you're outdoors so you think oh okay it's outdoors so I don't need to worry quite so much about social distancing because we've been told that being outdoors is is fine and then of course you're having fun and so when you're having fun you sort of relax like your guard slightly and then there's a bit of shouting at the referee and there's all sorts of opportunities for a virus to spread about if it's if it's there um, and so that's mixing together of people and we, what we really need to do just for the time being is reduce the, uh, reduce the amount that people who do not, are not part of the same household or part of the same um, support bubble are actually interacting with each other. And so kind of every little helps. And I understand that it's very frustrating. I mean, I'm, 
Um, I used to go swimming every single morning and now I'm going, I have been going once a week at my local pool and now obviously that stopped and I'm very frustrated by that because I could say, well, you know, the virus is um, killed by the chlorine, which it is, so why can't I go swimming? But the point is, I've interacted, albeit at a very distant, in a very distant way, in a very COVID secure way, to maybe 10 people every time I go swimming. Yeah. And so what it, it's a trade-off to reduce that amount of contact because we know it's so infectious. Sure. Okay. Um, loads of questions about the vaccine, um, and okay. uh, understandably, so people will be shouting at me if we don't get onto it now. Um, okay. So look, if uh, a vaccine is ready soon, this is one question, if the vaccine is ready soon, do you think it will be safe since it will be made at an unprecedented speed? It will definitely be safe because even though it will be made, it's been made quickly, it still has to go through all very stringent tests and national and international regulatory processes before it will be allowed for it to be given to you know the general population. So people should not be worried at all that it will be unsafe. Um, but that, of course, is one of the reasons why it's taking a bit longer than was first. And, to, you know, we were took they did say that we might have a vaccine by the autumn, didn't they, earlier on in the year. It's yep. taking a bit longer than everyone was hoping for, precisely because we want to make sure, A, that it's safe, and B, that it works. Okay. So it will definitely be safe. Right, okay. So uh, another question we have in is, do you have faith that there is an effective vaccine strategy that's put in place so that as soon as on the day that this is all approved, it can be rolled out to the right people? Well, I mean, that's just not really my area. I, <laughs> I have no idea what the vaccine strategy even is. But what I can say is that the vaccine is definitely going to be safe. What we don't really know is how effective it's going to be. Um, it is going through trials at the moment, and we hopefully it will be effective. But um, given what we know about the immunity to this coronavirus and how it doesn't last very long, my suspicion is that people will need boosters, maybe two or three boosters before it really before it really really works and that's quite quite standard for um, all vaccines um, the way that uh, the the two leading candidates um, in this country at the moment are being made is kind of quite similar in concept to the way the hepatitis b vaccines made and your some of the people listening to this might have had the hep b vaccine and they'll they'll be aware of the fact that it's a six month course, three doses of course over the course of six months. So, um, and then even then, some people have to come back and have a another booster maybe after a few years. But let's let's not worry about that. Let's talk about the first wave. You, you probably people will have to have boosters anyway. And so also, uh, so that means that. Everyone in the whole, in order for it to be really effective, everybody in the whole wide world is going to have to have mm. the first dose um, in a very, you know, in a very short space of time in order for it to be um, really effective um, in getting rid of the virus, as it were. So the other thing to, people should bear in mind is that the vaccine, when it does come, will be one of the tools in the toolbox. It's not going to be the quick fix answer to all our problems we will probably still have some outbreaks and we'll probably still have to do social distancing and and other things for a little while but um hopefully it'll be one one thing to help us to get the virus under control rather than a quick fix solution yeah. to everyone getting their life back tomorrow yeah okay so um we, we, there's another question saying who do you think would be the first to be given vaccinations i guess that comes back down to the same sort of strategy you were talking about before not really your area but would it be the more vulnerable groups the more elderly first um so that there could be a bit more of an easing of of well so obviously deaths will reduce and that's exactly what we're trying to do yes that's right i think it will go to the more vulnerable and probably people like healthcare workers and other frontline workers like bus drivers, I'd like to see it in those people, people who are more likely to come into contact with the virus in the course of their daily life. So that again, it reduces, not just protects those individuals from getting sick, but it reduces the transmission through, from, sure. if they haven't got it, then they're not going to give it to other people. So I imagine it will be 
the elderly and the people with underlying conditions for medical reasons and healthcare workers and other frontline key workers for sort of infection control reasons. Yes. Um, okay. And then perhaps see how that goes. Okay. So um, another <laughs> difficult question to answer. Um, I guess we're, it's a bit of a best case scenario question. Once we have vaccines in place, how long will it take to get it to a point where the virus uh, will be under control? That's a very, um, it's one of those questions that it's quite difficult to answer definitively. My, uh, my hope is that the vaccine will be available by the spring of next year. So I'm not looking for it to be available any earlier than that. If it turns out that there's something, a safe and active, effective vaccine is available in December or January, then I'll be very delighted to be wrong. But in my own mind, to keep myself going mm -hmm. and not not to you know i'm actually looking for you know april may of next year before a vaccine is available then we've got to go around and vaccinate a sufficient proportion of the right sort of people that is actually working so we're probably looking this time next year maybe this christmas might be off but maybe next christmas might be on i think that's probably um probably something to sort of aim for okay and okay. nothing earlier than that don't don't get your hopes up earlier than that and okay. if i'm if it turns out i'm wrong then i'll hold my hands up and say sorry i was wrong it was all over by by july of 2021 and i'll be i'll be no one will be happier than me to have been proved wrong on that one great okay um next question is when the vaccines are made available do you worry about the anti-vax movement uh, I do a little bit, yes. Um, I was hoping that the uh, the shock of um, COVID would have made people realise how important vaccines are and how dangerous infectious diseases are. One of the problems with the anti-vax movement that I think we've had in trying to persuade people to have vaccines is that they're not particularly afraid of infectious diseases. Because the vaccination programme since the sort of 1960s has been so effective, we're not actually worried about infectious diseases all that much, not nearly as much as we should do. Or I was hoping that, that people coming in face to face with, with a brand new infection that we didn't have a vaccine or a, um, an, an antiviral for, drug for or anything would make people realise that infectious diseases are dangerous and a vaccine is an important way of preventing it. Um, but it doesn't look as though that's necessarily going to happen because people have decided there is a lot of, there's along with the anti-vaxxers, it seems to be so quite some of the same people are anti-maskers as well. Mm, yeah. And they're also kind of denying the fact that the virus even exists. There are plenty of people doing that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, and so, um, those pe it's going to be it could be quite difficult to persuade them, particularly if there are some some doubt about how fast the vaccine was produced and how safe it actually is. Which is why I think it's important to um, it's important that scientists and anyone who's any of any of your listen any people listening to this should um, explain to people about vaccine safety and how rigorous that testing is going to be that they're not going to give something that's mm, that's not safe to people yep. and to reassure people that a vac having a vaccine is a is a good thing for you and for other people but yeah i think it might be a might be an issue it's a communication issue sure um another question then professor chris witty and sir patrick valance have said that they believe science will prevail when it comes to treatments for covid rather than just the vaccine do you believe that new or existing drugs will make a big difference eventually and when? Um, well, <laughs> as any of my students will tell you, that the, the, uh, the original and best antiviral drug is a thing called um, Zovirax, which, is, which people use, some, some of your listeners might use against their cold sores because it, it tests against Hopi simplex virus. That was developed in the 1970s. And after that, we've had a few antiviral drugs, but not very many. And some of them are quite toxic to humans because of the nature of the way humans live inside, sorry, viruses live inside human cells. So therefore you've got, it's a balance between killing the virus and not killing your own cell in a way that 
um, with antibiotics, which kill bacteria, bacteria are kind of different entities. So you can actually find something that kills a bacteria. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, isn't necessarily toxic to the human being. But the, uh, that's not the same for antivirals. So we don't have that many antivirals that are actually any good. There are some um, uh, Tamiflu and, and Relenza, which work against influenza, but unfortunately they don't seem to work against um, COVID-19 virus. Um, it's going to be difficult, I think, to find antivirals just because we've had difficulty finding antivirals for all the other viruses that we might want to have drugs against. In terms of the treatment of people with COVID disease though, that they, we do seem to be making some progress with that. So for example, dexamethasone, does seem to be quite effective against people to who are already seriously ill and in hospital, but it helps mm. with their their final um, their final outcome and perhaps stops them from getting um, into intensive care, or it can shorten the amount of time they have to be on treatment um, in intensive care. But um, I wouldn't I wouldn't get I wouldn't get I wouldn't get any hopes up about that one either. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to combine two questions here because um, they're kind of in the same kind of ballpark. So um, yeah. one person says uh, about masks, we've been wearing them since July compuls in a compulsory fashion for, uh, but the infection rates have only risen since then. So people are refusing to wear them or people are just putting them from their pockets or their bags. Uh, especially ones that aren't supposed to be reusable. Some reusable ones aren't uh, literally just a piece of fabric and maybe not that helpful. Um, so that's one question for one person that's saying, is it actually helping? And there's another one who then says, do they work in general? Because is it actually causing more problems as breathing grounds for bacteria for other issues? So we know that the virus is transmitted through you, your, um, it's coming from your lungs and it comes out through your mouth and nose. So anything which, and then it goes into the, into the environment and it can be um, picked up by other people around you. So anything which stops the virus coming from you and getting to the surrounding area and then being passed on to someone else is going to be helpful. Whatever form that covering takes, even if it's just a scarf that you've put around your nose on the way into the supermarket, it's going to help. So um, I mean, it's not necessarily going to be foolproof, it's not going to be perfect, but it's every, all the things we're doing is trying to help a little bit to stop the transmission. So it's definitely going to help. Um, in terms of um, being a breeding ground for bacteria, I suppose that's possible. But if you're breathing in and out into that mask, it's going to be mostly your own, mm -hmm. your own bacteria. Um, and then I suppose you could pick stuff up. Um, if you go into a shop, you could pick up stuff, you know, on the outside of it, which is why you should always you should either dispose of your mark of your mask after one use if it's a disposable mask or wash it mm -hmm. if it's a um if it's a cloth one um and so just being care of regular just being careful of regular hygiene for your mask but it's definitely worth doing it mm -hmm. even if it's not 100 percent effective it's even if if it's only 70% effective, that helps. We're all doing our bit to help ourselves and mostly each other, and it's definitely going to help with that. Okay, um, so um, final one on masks from one listener who says, who asks, will face coverings become the norm in Europe or the sort of Western world, the, 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 uh, as, as they already are in some countries such as in Asia? I think it's quite interesting, isn't it? It might do. And I think if you look that Asia countries suffered very badly from SARS-1 mm. and they, that's where it started and it's carried on from there. It's just kind of become normal now and um, it may well do. One of the things which I think is quite interesting is how um, wearing gloves when you're going for a, a medical procedure has became standard after um, HIV came along in the 1980s whereas before that it was it was it wasn't something that people did and actually people at the time there was a lot of discussion about it because people felt very awkward about it and they felt it was a little bit impersonal if your doctor or dentist was wearing latex gloves before they touched you and people didn't like wearing them um 
uh, they, they've we moved from latex to vinyl gloves because a lot of people, including myself, actually, a lot of healthcare workers got um, contact dermatitis from the latex mm. and um, the latex plus the powder. And um, but now it's become kind of standard. And any any football fans in the audience will remember, will know that if a player gets even a drop of a hint of a drop of blood on their football shirt, they have to come off the pitch and change their shirt for a clean one. That didn't happen before, before HIV came along. It didn't matter how much blood and guts and dirt and things you had on your shirt, you just carried on playing it and then you took it home and put it in your own washing machine when you got home, I think. Um, but it, and now it's normal and people would be horrified to if we didn't do that, mm. because we are aware. It, I'm, not, I'm not sure we're even aware of why we're doing it. We just, that, that's what we do. And so I, I think it might become more of a routine thing. Um, particularly when you're in um, enclosed spaces with, uh, with people you don't, you don't know. So, so in a shop or something. And we might, we might get used to it and it might not be, I know it's not quite the same as wearing gloves when you go to the dentist. We might get used to it more. And if the, if the price, if that's the price we have to pay for being able to hug our loved ones and do uh, singing um, again and things like that, then it would probably be worth it, I would have thought. Yeah. Okay. Um, hypothetical question. If this virus came about 10 years ago, how much worse would it have been? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Um, In terms of our ability, have, yeah, to, to, the to deal with it. testing would have been a bit more difficult because the, 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 although we've, we've had trouble sort of scaling up the, the, the COVID-19 testing, the actual, te the actual, the, the main laboratory PCR test, the technical side of it, and the, 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 um, uh, the way the test actually works, is very, very routine. It's just that what wasn't routine was the kits for that particular test. You know, we had to invent a way of incorporating the, the SARS-CoV-2 genome, oh, sorry, the SARS-CoV-2, um, uh, material into the existing main laboratory tests mm -hmm. but actually it's a very standard procedure that they're doing they, that it's the same test they use for all other you know respiratory viruses and fecal viruses and so on um sort of gut bacteria no sort of gut yeah actually gut bacteria and gut viruses norovirus and influenza and all those sorts of things um which probably might not have been the case 10 years ago mm. Okay. But on the other hand, I think we probably do much more international travel than we did 10 years ago. It's become, I certainly have done a lot more flying. I went abroad five times last year, yeah. which I wouldn't have been able to afford to do, I don't think, 10 years earlier. And that could be because I'm 10 years older and earning a little bit more money than I was 10 years ago. But also, I don't think it was as normal for people to move around so much quite so much 10 years ago so it might um because SARS-1 didn't spread that I know that was 20 years ago didn't spread around the world quite as rapidly um because you know they they were able to get that one under control a bit more easily mm. and I'm I'm at least some of it is the amount of international travel that people were doing last year has helped to spread the virus mm. very very quickly okay um and the final question uh, do you have faith that we will learn from this pandemic and that we'll be able to get an early hold on future viruses like this one? I, yeah, I'd like to say yes. I, but it's just, it's a hope. It's a hope that we will learn our lessons from this. This has been a big wake up call for the world, hasn't it? Mm. Um, and I, I think, as I said earlier, it's been a big lesson in how important and how dangerous infectious diseases can be. I think we've got a little bit complacent about that, but also we probably got a bit complacent about public health systems and public health services. Um, and also I think we do have to learn as a world that we need to cooperate with each other, work together, learn from each other. It's not a competition. If one, if one country is doing better in developing a test or developing a vaccine, that sh people should share that. Um, knowledge and should you know help or kind of what share their information and their insights and their ideas and kind of pool our resources so that because if we all benefit from 
from you know from working together in that sense and we all we all lose out if we're not um working working as a sort of coherent world yeah. so i think i'd be cautiously optimistic that we will learn from this and i would say that we have to we really have to um but i'm not sure that i i'm not sure we definitely will but i That's hope we so. will yeah Look, Sarah, thanks so much for coming on the podcast again. It's been so good to get some of those questions answered from a real expert. And, and, and I'm sure we'll be doing this again um, in the coming months. And hopefully there'll be um, a bit more light at the end of the tunnel when we get to that point. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you can subscribe to this podcast via all the usual methods. Just go to your usual podcast app. Um, we'll be back next week when we'll be discussing the US election. Thanks for listening.